Welcome everyone, Costini here with a discussion about the most broken and overpowered legendary lords and their campaigns in Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires. Now these legendary lords are so broken that you will be steamrolling their campaigns from pretty much the beginning till the very end of those campaigns, unless we're talking about here some doom stack you encounter during the course of the campaign or an end game crisis. These are the kind of campaigns where you could probably set the ultimate end game crisis pretty early on and while it would certainly be a significant challenge, you likely could handle that. They are that broken. They are that powerful. I am not, however, going to include the most broken legendary lord in the game currently, which is of course Orion for the Wood Elves, because Creative Assembly has stated they are going to change them. I think that when they did decide to make him uh, stronger, because he was the worst legendary lord for the Wood Elves, uh, they went a bit overboard. So we have to wait and see what they're going to do with him with regards to the patch that's going to come out. The Immortal Empire's launch patch didn't really change anything. Uh, it did include a couple of bug fixes, but it didn't really implement any major changes. So we're still waiting for those, and we'll see how things work out. Starting with Arkhan the Black at number 5 on this particular list, Arkhan has a lot of the things that a lot of legendary lords in this game would could only dream of. He has significant faction-wide benefits that significantly benefit the race he is part of, the Tomb Kings. Now, the Tomb Kings in general are limited in terms of their heroes, in terms of their lords, in terms of the number of armies that they can recruit. But here's the beauty of Arkhan. He has, with his faction, he has the ability of recruiting his own unique units. Crypt Goals, Direwells, Falbats, as the Tomb King Legendary Lord. He gets them from the Vampire Counts. He does this through a structure that he can get in any settlement, be it a Tier, a tier 1 settlement, all the way up to Tier 3. So this works in uh, minor settlements as well. So you can get a lot of units, which can actually be a big problem in the Tomb King campaign uh, that you just flat out end up without units to recruit. Now, these units aren't the best, but they're certainly better than the Skeletal Spearmen and Skeletal Warriors that the Tomb Kings in general has to deal with. Beyond that, this is just the start for Arkhan. In itself, this would be a significant benefit, but beyond that, it goes even further. See, Arkhan has one of the best starting positions in the entire game. He starts here in this corner of the map in Araby. Now, what's important about this starting position is that it's very safe. Even if a faction wants to invade you via the sea, you will notice that coming in general. If someone's going to invade you via the sea, especially when there's a distance, you can see that coming because the line of sight... Um, n not just because of the line of sight, but also because it does take time for an army to actually disembark, right? I mean, sure, this port uh, settlement here can uh, can be attacked pretty easily, but you know where the enemy is going to attack if they're going to invade you. It is pretty obvious. It's pretty obvious when they're coming to your, towards you, you're not going to be surprised, even if an enemy comes across the ocean. And the rest of the territory that you have to deal with, uh, in your early game especially, is very secure. Because it's uh, to the south here, in the Great Desert of Araby, you have a, lo a large distance to cover, so you're e so an army is going to be easily noticeable if they're trying to go through here. And in the north, you have a narrow choke point to defend your territory if anyone does decide to attack you from the north. So you have a very strong, very defensible starting position that carries with it a lot of benefits. Now, of course, there are downsides because um, two of these settlements are ports, so you're not going to be able to get a bunch of buildings here, which would be more beneficial for a Tomb Kim campaign. But you do start with two regions, and you can easily get a third, because your starring army can auto-resolve against this army no. and against Selmond here on turn one on legendary very hard battle difficulty. So that means you're just steamrolling your initial opponent, and you 
don't have any other at the start with the exception of Cetra, but Cetra is pretty far away and he has his own larger number of issues. And on top of that, Arkan can recruit an extra army from the very start of his campaign as a Tomb King Legendary Lord. Now what this means, beyond the obvious early game advantage, what this means is throughout his entire campaign he will outpace every other Legendary Lord of the Tomb Kings, he'll have more armies, he'll have more units, he'll have a much better and safer starting position from which to grow his empire. In fact, all of these benefits combined make Arkhan one of the best legendary lords in the game, even when played by the AI, which is not necessarily the case for the other legendary lords on this list. I've never seen Arkhan played by the AI lose a campaign, or very, very rarely does he ever lose a campaign. And if he loses a campaign, he's losing it to Rapunz. He's not losing it in the midterm or in the long term. Like, Rapunz usually does lose to Arkhan on legendary difficulty at the very least if you're playing with very hard battle difficulty. Because she does have her own, her own issues in her own campaign. And if Arkhan is able to take uh, the province in the north, the coast of Araby, he is so powerful that I've genuinely seen this guy numerous times fight off Cetra, Volkmar, and Scarbrand. Like, the, that was the peak example where Scarbrand, Cetra, and Volkmar kind of had this alliance going aimed at Arkhan, and they couldn't defeat him. He couldn't expand out of his, uh, his starring provinces, but he wasn't losing either. And anyone who can fight Cetra, in uh, who was in control of most of Camry at that point, Volkmar in control of multiple provinces and freaking Scarbrand when controlled by the AI. Um, and we're not talking, I'm, I'm not talking here about a weak Scarbrand, I'm talking one that controlled the Badlands. Anyone who can do that is a pretty damn powerful Legion Lord. Again, it ties into uh, to the starting position, the fact he gets more unit types than anyone else. So he doesn't need as many structures. He's very rarely going to end up in that position where he just doesn't have units to recruit. Good beyond skeletal uh, warriors and spearmen, and um, he's he's just going to have a lot more flexibility on the campaign map than any other lord of the uh, legendary lord of the tomb kings. Now, I do think this campaign can feel very boring and bland, and actually, it's not the only campaign on this list that can feel very boring and bland because it's too much of a steamroll. But the power is absolutely there. If you want to play a campaign where you're just steamrolling your enemies from ver the very first turn of your campaign without any kind of genuine opposition, Arkhan is the place to start. Though he's actually not the most ridiculous legendary lord on this list. And number four, we have Oxyatl of the Lizardmen. Now, I generally don't think too much of the Lizardmen as a race. They're okay, but the problem is they generally get taken down by the expensive armies that uh, they are they generally field if you're playing many of their campaigns but Oxyatl is really the exception in terms of lizardman campaign it's because he focuses on skirmisher infantry units the chameleon skinks and the chameleon stalkers in particular and what he does is he can buff them significantly when they are part of his uh, own army so he can give them snipe what snipe does is it allows them to shoot while they're still in stealth that has a pretty substantial amount of power and he does get other benefits as well like campaign movement range ammunition a great deal of power for him like with his lord effects he can genuinely win a lot of battles that in the first place would not be winnable battles and secondly, he can win them without losing a single model. Not, not a unit, a model in a unit. I've personally played an Oxyatl campaign. The level of power this guy has in his own army, let alone the other armies in his faction, is absolutely ridiculous. And that's just the start. Having a powerful army, you know, other lords have a powerful army. Warzag, Grimgor, etc. But um, Oxyatl then brings uh, quite a few benefits faction-wide, because he gets an upkeep benefit, for those uh, units, he also gives them additional benefits faction-wide when they gain levels. But that's just the start. Having powerful armies of certain unit types, uh, some other legendary lords do that as well. And do it very well. 
Now, what sets um, Axiatl apart from many other legendary lords isn't the army itself. In fact, you could just get rid of these units. Never use them in a campaign as Axiatl. You'd be stupid to do so because they're really powerful and work very well. Um, it's kind of like a Skaven playstyle, actually, because that's what Skaven want to do. Though, unlike Skaven, you actually have better armor, so you do have a better uh, auto-resolve outcome. Though, generally speaking, the best results you will... Uh, you'll get by fighting battles manually. But here's the thing where Axiatl goes completely crazy. Not only does he have an amazing starting position over here in the southern, southwestern Chaos Waste, where the only opponent in this part of the world that you're in, the only real threat is Kairos Fate Weaver. And I gotta say, playing a campaign as Kairos, you have to earn your victory. It is a hard victory turn. For Axiatl, Kairos will can slow you down, but that's about it. He won't stand up to you. But what gives Axiatl power beyond an incredibly good starting position, similarly to how Arkan is powerful because of his start position, it's also the missions, the unique missions that he has in his campaign. So Axiatl can teleport around the campaign map between Hinden Sanctums that uh, have a teleportation pad as well as his uh, capital. But he, throughout the campaign, he will gain various missions around the world to fight the forces of evil, really, or the forces of disorder, if you want to call them that. And these will give you significant benefits. Like, look at his starting uh, mission. His starting mission, which, by the way, is just his starting enemy, which for vast majority of factions won't give you anything, he gains 5,000 gold. And that's just the start. Missions... Throughout the campaign will give him significant faction-wide benefits, lots of money, and crucially, uh, crucially, they will allow him to teleport around the map. And here's the thing about Axiatl. Every climate in the game is suitable climate for him. You can conquer the world as Axiatl and you can do it faster and cheaper than the vast majority of legendary lords in the game. Because it's actually very rare that a legendary lord has every climate being suitable, and generally those that do have some kind of issue. Axiatl is part of a race that plays like a you know baseline race, a generic race, but he can conquer the world. Doesn't matter where it is. That is a ridiculous amount of power in of itself, coupled with the fact that he gets these missions that um, require him to tel teleport to a corner of the world in order to do them. That is further power that Axiatl has in his campaign. In fact, it was so ridiculous that they actually nerfed it so you can't just do it however many times you want in a single turn. You actually do have a limit of one teleportation per turn. But even then, it is still absolutely ridiculous. And these missions will give you a very substantial benefit for your entire faction. And that the reward for, the, for a lot of these missions is to get blessed spawnings. So what are blessed spawnings? Well, blessed spawnings are basically regular lizard men, legendary lords, certain types, not all of them. But the vast majority of the legend, uh, the unit roster of the lizard men um, can have blessed spawnings. Blessed spawnings are just slightly better versions. Oxyot, uh, generally speaking, with a lizard men campaign, you get blessed spawnings through a random event you just get the dynamic event that asks you to do an objective and you get like three blessed spawnings or one if it's a really good unit. As Axiatl, you get them a lot more frequently because the missions you're getting are a lot more frequent. So Axiatl can have a global recruitment pool of really powerful units that are better than anything else in the Lizardman roster that he can recruit globally. So... Put yourself in this shoe, in this situation where you save up a lot of units in your blessed spawnings. You get a mission to teleport halfway across the world. Well, suddenly you can recruit 20 units in a single turn. It may even, even more. And the, all those units are going to be really good units. And you can just completely conquer all, the na all of your neighbors in the new region of the game that you just teleported to. So, if, say for instance you get the mission uh, in Sylvania to just beat up on the vampire counts, right? 
Well, you do it, and then you just conquer a territory. The mission itself might be to conquer a territory. You conquer a territory, you recruit the second army, you get the blessed spawnings, and no one can stop you. And that's an example against Vlad, who certainly isn't a cakewalk of a legendary lord. But Oxyatl can make a cakewalk. Just the ability to show up with a full stack army around the world is incredible. And by the way, this is something you can actually do. You don't need to depend on the missions because one of the things you can do in your campaign is you can set up these hidden sanctums throughout the campaign. And what these hidden sanctums will do uh, will give you the ability to teleport. So imagine just showing up randomly at someone's doorstep with a full stack of units. They're not going to be able to stop you even if they try. Is ridiculously powerful. Is ridiculously uh, a ridiculously powerful playstyle that he has. A very powerful army that he has access to. He personally is kind of pathetic in battles, actually, because ranged heroes, ranged lords do very poorly. But the lord effects and faction effects are absolutely out, out of this world when it comes to the strength that uh, they have. So Axiatl, great deal of power, great deal of flexibility in his campaign. And certainly one of the better campaigns that actually exists right now for Warhammer 3. Just because it's fun to have a campaign that's more dynamic, that makes you travel around the world dealing with various uh, issues. And how you decide to deal with those things, as well as the opportunities they present, that's what makes it a really good campaign and a very powerful legendary lord. At number three, we have a Leafanar for the High Elves. The High Elves are one of the more powerful races in the game. Unlike the Tomb Kings and unlike the Lizardmen, the High Elves themselves, by default, in a generic playstyle, are certainly very, very powerful. And then enters a Leafanar. So Leafanar has some really nice effects when it comes to his faction. He has Renegade as a skill, which gives you up to 12 missile strength faction wide. On top of that, he also gains 15% campaign movement range after winning a battle. That is a great deal of power. That kind of effect is certainly very, very powerful during a campaign. He also gets 10% campaign movement range by default and has a global recruitment duration, uh, which is always really nice to have. And he has the ability to summon assassins that can insta-kill any hero or lord in uh, the game. Now, this is incredibly powerful because you can use this hero to eliminate faction leaders that can give you an, uh, that can create issues during your campaign. So, hey, let's say you're going up uh, against a really powerful faction in a war, and they are bringing their doomstack of an army. Because what generally tends to happen uh, with a lot of factions is that, let's say, Malekith who is Alifanar's nemesis. Well, what Malekith will do is his army will be the most powerful army of his faction. If you rob them of their leader before the battle, however, you're going to have a much easier battle on your hands. That is in itself a great deal of power. But really, that's just you know the icing on the cake, really. Alifanar does have other benefits as well. He His regular movement stance the one he uses to attack enemies in, is an ambush stance. So any battle you fight on an open field has a chance to be an ambush battle. And an ambush battle is significantly beneficial to you as the ambusher. On top of that, he also has a lot of flexibility of getting around on the campaign map because he has an underway mechanic via the Shadow Realms pathways. He's kind of like a Skaven Legendary Lord, really playing as the High Elf. So he combines some of the real strengths of the Skaven with the main, many, many benefits of the High Elves. And by the way, these stances, they apply to every Lord in his campaign, not just him. This is not exclusive to just his own army. It's, it's for every army in his faction. You do lo lose the Winds of Magic stance to get uh, the Underway stance, but it doesn't really matter, honestly. I like that's a very worthy trade off when it comes down to it. Furthermore, he has a unit type that only he can recruit in his campaign the Shadow Walkers, which are pretty good or one of the best range units for a faction that already has some really, really good range units. 
On top of that, uh, on, to on top of that, when it comes to Elite Fanar, he has a similar benefit to Oxyatl in that he also has missions on the campaign map that give him significant faction-wide benefits. I would dare say that his ben the benefits he gets from these assassination missions beat the crap out of anything Oxyatl gets. I mean, he won't be able to summon a Doomstack in a single turn, but he does get some very significant benefits, like, like the starting ones. Consider the starting ones, and they can be random, but consider the starting ones. You can get... Uh, you can get the minus 50% recruitment cost for Shadow Warriors and Shadow Walkers. You have one that causes fear when fighting uh, against Dark Elves. And that's, by the way, the starting army you deal with in your campaign. And then you have one that just gives you extra money. Like, all of them will give you extra money. Some will give you a ridiculous amount of money. And all of these will also give you influence. And influence is useful because you can use it to manipulate diplomatic relations. So Ali Fanar can actually have the most amount of influence of any High Elven Legion Lord just because of these kind of missions. And the assassins that he can summon, uh, he can use those to fulfill these missions. Because some of these missions, the objectives of some of these missions can be really, really far away. So a great deal of power and benefits when it comes to Ali Fanar. Now, this is, as far as I'm concerned, the best campaign in the game, flat out. It's not, he's not the most powerful legendary lord, far from it, but he is a really powerful lord. He does have a difficult campaign, but it doesn't start difficult, it goes up in difficulty. And you kind of need to know what you're doing in, in order to make uh, the most out of it, really. But the power is very substantial. The benefit, the campaign benefits are incredible. Uh, like the movement range, the freedom of movement via the underway, the ambush stance, it is an incredible amount of power. Actually, the ambush stance, I would say, is the least substantial benefit in his campaign compared to like just the underway, because that gives you a lot of uh, flexibility moving across a lot of types of terrain, uh, as well as, of course, just the uh, assassination missions, as well as the benefits that those assassination missions do provide. So, a great deal of power for him, a really good campaign, and just an incredibly overpowered Legendary Lord for a race that has some of the more powerful Legendary Lords or some of the most powerful Legendary Lords in the game. He is the most powerful Legendary Lord for one of the most powerful races in the game. And for good reasons. For very, very good, uh, good, good reasons because of the faction-wide benefits he has, as well as just the sheer power he has with his own... Uh, personal army because there is also a great deal of power that he personally has in his own army it's not just faction-wide benefits it's also benefits he personally has in his army like missile strength 10 percent against dark elves for instance or ammo for shadow warriors and shadow walkers all that kind of stuff or ambush success chance that he does have number two we have grom the paunch of the greenskins the Greenskins are one of the most powerful races in the game. Good growth, good economy, good unit roster, very powerful unit roster from beginning to the finish. Even their most basic goblin archers, which you can recruit from any tier 1 settlement, are still really strong. But that's just the race, right? The race itself being strong, that certainly helps them. But Grom supercharges this already very powerful race. He personally has uh, the Goblin Tide skill, which improves the armor of Goblin units by 15 points. Now, improving the armor by 15 for Goblin units means these nasty Skulkers get double uh, the armor under Grom's leadership. So that is a fairly significant amount of armor that he's giving them through that skill line. Now, that's a generic skill line. Any uh, Goblin, uh, and any Goblin, a uh, goblin great shaman can get it but it is pretty powerful to have it on a melee lord as opposed to what skarsnik has in his campaign now on top of that he does have some other benefits casualty replenishment growth 15 in all provinces that is actually pretty uh, damn good uh, to improve the greenskins uh, increasing uh, post battle loot and sacking settlements for himself other benefits as well so there's a great deal of power that grom has but the biggest amount of power comes from his faction-wide benefits. He gets Grom's Cauldron, 
and he gets a global duration benefit, uh, recruitment uh, benefit of minus one turn for goblin units. So th what this really means is that regardless of the territory he's in, he can instantly recruit goblin units. That is a significant amount of power, a ridiculous amount of power, because we're talking here nasty skulkers, we're talking here goblin archers, we're talking here night goblin archers being instantly recruited globally. A great deal of power there. But it's really the cauldron that wins Grom this particular position. See, the cauldron gives you faction-wide benefits. You already start with troll meat, which is pretty appropriate for Grom, and you can easily get ocean clams as well as some other benefits. But let's just look at the first two that Grom can get very, very early in his campaign. He can get a random amount of money and 10% casualty replenishment. And he also starts with better casualty replenishment oh, no, than any other green skin journey lord because he starts with the giant river troll hack. So his casualty replenishment from the very start of his campaign is going to be ridiculously powerful. Now this is really good for the greenskins because the greenskins, although very powerful, they oh, don't necessarily have the best not resolve armies. They're strong, but they're not ridiculously strong like uh, some other races. And because of that, he's going to take some damage. Being able to recuperate from that damage pretty quickly is important. But that's just a start. Eventually, you get other benefits, like a 10% income from sacking and looting settlements, or an income benefit of 10%, as well as a global recruitment duration for all units of minus one turn. That is ridiculous. Or aid control to all provinces. Or army benefits that give you explosive ammunition. Or growth benefits to uh, your entire faction on top of the growth benefit that he has as part of his skin line. So what this really translates into is that Grom can grow his empire faster than any other green skin legendary lord. He can have a bigger economy than any other green skin legendary lord. And because of that, he can dominate the map more so than any other Greenskin Legendary Lord. Like all the Greenskin Legendary Lords can dominate the map, Grom just does it better and faster. And it's actually ridiculous when you think about it, because he starts in unpleasant climate surrounding him. Though he can conquer Wolf One, which is always nice because you will get the massive benefit from having Wolf One under control. Because Wolf One, if you can take it, if you can colonize it, Wolf One is an amazing part of the game to have as the core of your empire provided you can of course uh, take it so of course he has uh, the wasteland and mountains like every greenskin legendary lord he also has the savannah so grom does have some very significant faction benefits and when all when everything is added together the power of the greenskins the power of the cauldron his own personal power you get the campaign where grom can literally conquer all of his neighbors Anyone that can just waltz in Alpha Lauren early on in a campaign and go to war with these four factions and win is an incredibly powerful legendary lord. And I've done this as Grom. It is such a ridiculous campaign because every one of your neighbors except uh, these minor greenskins, which you can save by the way, do dislike you. But you can conquer every single one of them with ease. You won't have to put in effort. It's not really about the effort. You might have to fight some battles manually, but you can conquer all of them with ease, with significant ease, during the course of your campaign. And none of them will be able to stand in your way. Not Bretonia, not the Empire, not the Wood Elves, really. Though the Wood Elves will pick up, put up the biggest fight, especially Durfo over here. But outside of that, none of them are going to be able to stand in your way. That is... A biblical amount of power that Grom has at his disposal in his campaign just because he'll have a lot of money he can literally print money for scrap if there's only any do downside is that you have to use scrap for cooking so that means you're gonna have less scrap for upgrading units but it doesn't really matter when we're thinking about Grom the punch because he'll have so many armies that he'll get be getting a lot more fights anyway than the other greens can generally lord so it evens itself out anyway regardless of that so, incredible power with Grom the Paunch. And finally, and number one, it is the shared position between Bellacor and Archeon. Both of them champions of Chaos Undivided. Both of them 
legendary lords for the Warriors of Chaos. The Warriors of Chaos are one of the best races. They, or the Greenskins, are the top race, are vying for the number one spot on this list. I would say Greenskin campaigns in general tend to be more interesting uh, to play when it comes down to it. And indeed, Warriors of Chaos can be pretty boring because they're so ridiculously powerful. And they're powerful in a way that makes their campaigns boring because you can't lose and you don't really need a massive empire and you'll just have a lot of vassals fighting for you. But anyway, what, with regards to Bellacor and Archeon, they're both at this number one spot. They both share it for very similar reasons, actually. So Warriors of Chaos are really powerful because they can recruit a lot of units for Warband recruitment and can upgrade them. And in fact, this Warband system, this Warband upgrade system, it, I would recommend actually getting a mod that allows you to use it uh, for any campaign because it is such a great system to not have to replace your low tier units or higher tier units as you uh, get the structures for them and just instead uh, continue to upgrade them throughout the campaign. I would probably say some modifications so that you actually have to get the buildings uh, in the first place would be great, but all the same, it is a really, really good system. Uh, what, at least the upgrade system. The recruitment system, not necessarily so, but the upgrade system certainly is. Now, um, oh, Warriors Cast really powerful because the Dark Fortresses and Vassals basically make them make it impossible for them to lose a campaign. Maybe an endgame crisis if you trigger that very early on, and if it's next to you, yes, but even then you would put up a really good fight against them. Endgame Crisis or Ultimate Endgame Crisis. They are that ridiculously powerful. They have a good economy. They have the ability of gaining money from vassals. The more vassals, the more power they have. Um, and the vassals can do a lot of the fight for them. And on top of that, they have a great deal of power through uh, the Gifts of Chaos. And I'm just going to uh, go um, uh, go get this Dark Fortress as, uh, as Bellacor. And it is, by the way, pretty absurd how much power Bellacor actually does have from the very beginning uh, of his campaign. Because he starts in neutral territory, so he can actually get his initial uh, gifted uh, unit of chaos. It is a laughing uh, situation, really, for his uh, particular uh, campaign. So, okay. When... Uh, when it comes to the Gifts of Chaos, you do have some very significant benefits, be it uh, growth uh, with Nurgle or replenishment in foreign territory, which is always nice to, uh, to have. A potential significant uh, income, uh, or first off, you do have a potential significant income from Slanesh, or you have a campaign movement range of 35%. That is actually the highest, I think, in the entire campaign. Of course, with the significant outside of 15% upkeep, but you can afford that. I mean, you'll have fewer armies, but those armies will certainly traverse a lot more territory, a lot more, qu uh, uh, a lot more quickly uh, during the campaign. Um, Siege is not really worth talking about. Corn, however, is worth talking about, like income from post-battle loot, from raising settlements, character experience per turn, a great deal of power with the Gifts of Chaos, but especially with Undivided, 15% missile resistance is ridiculous when it comes down to it, and so are uh, so is the ability of gaining Hell Cannons. Great deal of power in every single one of these campaigns. But why are Archeon and Bellacor so far ahead of everyone else. Well, first off, they do have relatively good starting positions. Like Bellacor here, he starts on Alpion, he has two vassals around him, no one's invading this island. Or if they're invading this island, they're bringing in multiple stacks just to overcome your vassals. Just to understand that, it. it would take mul probably multiple stacks just to beat the vassals, or a really powerful doom stack under a legendary lord to overcome the vassals. Uh, that's for Bellacor. Archeon starts over here and tucked away in this nice corner in his initial Dark Fortress, so even, so it's more vulnerable, but, in a way, but if someone wants to invade Archeon, they're gonna have to cr go over all of this territory to actually reach him. They're gonna take attrition along the way if they're marching normally, or they're gonna have to go for any camp stands. And even when they reach him, it's not like it's an easy fight in that Dark Fortress, so it's practically impossible to lose a campaign as either Archeon or Bellacor. Um, when it comes to the benefits, it's really the faction-wide benefits that make these guys so powerful, as opposed to their lord effects. Now, don't get me wrong, their lord effects are nothing to sneeze at, either. They're pretty good as well. 
but it's really the it's really the faction wide benefits. Archeon gets a benefit to diplomacy with chaos factions, a benefit to research, and a benefit to souls. He gets twenty five souls for each of the vassal he gains. Bellacor gets a minus twenty five percent upkeep. Starts with all of the gifts of chaos, so all of the chaos gods start unlocked, and uh, hero. Um, human lords can be corrupted into becoming demon princes. So he's actually better. You can play the demon prince better as Bellacor if, uh, than the actual demon prince pa faction. It, that faction is so pathetic in, in comparison. So Bellacor, the true demon prince of chaos. And in fact, both Hei and Archeon in Age of Sigmar right now are two of the most important, or certainly the most powerful, uh, chaos factions currently in the, in the lore. And they're actually competing against one another. Now, for Bellacor, the benefit is that um, he can get full armies of demons because he's not limited by the Gifts of Chaos. And this applies to every single one of uh, his armies. And he can also get exalted versions of these units. He can actually upgrade like Blood Letters to Exalted Blood Letters, uh, Demonets to Exalted Demonets. I would not bother, by the way, with Exalted Demonets or anything like that. Uh, I would say Blood Letters may be Plague Bearers, but Blood Letters are just a better choice in pretty much every single way. By a great deal of power of that. You want to run around with doom stacks of just made, just made up of blood firsters? You can. In fact, you'll probably be able to access those blood firsters uh, faster than anyone else, um, with the exception of Valkia, of course. But even then, you're just better than Valkia when it comes to faction effects. The most substantial benefit, really, though, for both Archeon and Bellacor is not the research, diplomacy, or souls that Archeon gets, or the upkeep benefit and the gifts of chaos, uh, starting gift, uh, gifts of chaos that Bellacor has. No, those are not the most substantial benefits. Far from it. Not their starting positions, not their faction effects. It's really one specific thing that really benefits their campaigns. They can confederate, force confederation, with all of the other legendary lords of chaos. Now, every other legendary lord of chaos is a powerhouse in of itself. So be, imagine a campaign as Bellacor or Archon where you get all of them, all the others, in your campaign. Then you under, start to understand the biblical level of power that these two uh, guys have. Both of them have it. They're the only two that can do it out of all the Warriors of Chaos legendary lords. Sigvald can't do it. Kolek can't do it. It's a specific thing that only they have. And that is ridiculously powerful. Between the two of them, which would I say is better? Well, Bellacor is much better from a starting perspective. In the sense that he's going to have a lot of enemies to fight. He's going to gain a lot of souls early on in his campaign. Um... So, uh, I mean, Archeon does have quite a few factions to fight, but they're mainly minor factions. Bellacor can dive right into the fray against Ulfwan, against Alifanar, if you so desire, against Bretonia. He does have quite a lot of flexibility in the campaign. Uh, and he can vassalize a lot of these factions as well. Like, Archeon can get a lot of weak vassals, Bellacor can get a lot of powerful vassals from early on in his campaign. I mean, you can get Wolfric as a vassal pretty damn early in your campaign if uh, if you're playing if you're playing as Bellacor. Ridiculous amount of power in of itself uh, there. Um, but Bellacor is better early game, but in the long term, in the very long term, like if you're playing a very long campaign, Archeon is the better choice just because of the ridiculous souls benefit you're getting. In, in fact, the souls benefits that Archeon gets will allow him to actually get more demonic units than Bellacor, uh, at least when it comes to the higher end stuff, because he'll because if you're playing as Archeon, what you can do is you can end up getting so many souls per turn that you can constantly switch between between gifts and so get just blood firsters every you know every two turns, more or less. That is ridiculous um, a ridiculous amount of power that Archeon has. Sure, Archeon does have a limit of gifted units per army, but You'll just spread them around on dozens of armies if you're playing as Archeon. That said, Bellacor is certainly the better short-term uh, campaign, and it's not like Bellacor is weak uh, late game either, because he can afford those demons better than Archeon. Like Archeon has the better um, the better 
chance of getting them, Bellacor can actually afford them far easier. Bellacor is actually a better demonic faction than any other demonic faction in the game, than any of the demonic the factions in the game, because of that upkeep benefit, because he has a good economy behind him, so he has a, real, uh, a great deal of things going for him during the course of his campaign it is actually quite very ridiculous when you add everything up to uh, together for both Bellacor and Arkham. Both of them are strong uh, legendary lords and battles. Both of them have the capability of just flat out out resolving every single one of their battles and their campaign. That's not necessarily something you can say about uh, any other legendary lord on this list, with the exception of maybe Arkhan. But even so, from Bellacor and Archeon, just the fact that they cannot resolve the vast majority of encounters, if not all of the encounters in their campaign, with the exception of like an endgame crisis, shows you their level of power. And both Archeon and Bellacor won the poll that I did with like 70% of the vote. That gives you an idea, because none of these guys are weak. None of the guys on this list are weak by any stretch of the imagination. They're really, really powerful. The fact that Bellacor and Archeon got 70% of the vote on that poll should give you an indication of how ridiculous Bellacor and Archeon are, even among the most powerful legendary lords in the game. And that's all there is to it. Costin here signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and I'll see you boys and girls next time.